Stan Grant is a multi-award winning current affairs host, author and adventurer, and his Aboriginal heritage has shaped his dynamic personality. He was born in Griffith in southwest New South Wales. Stan's mother is from the Kamaluroi uh, people, I'm, I'm, I hope, I hope I've, and his, his father is of, the, of, is of the Wiradjuri. Stan has hosted major news and current affairs programs on Australian commercial and public television. And he's been a correspondent for the ABC, the Seven Network, and a senior international correspondent for CNN um, based in Hong Kong and Beijing. He returned to Australia in 2013, and he now works as the Indigenous editor of the, for The Guardian Australia, uh, the managing editor for National Indigenous Television, and international editor for Sky News. Stan has won many major awards, including an Australian TV Logie, a Columbia University DuPont Award, which is the broadcast equivalent of a Pulitzer Prize, and the prestigious US Peabody Award. He's a four-time winner of the highly prized Asia TV Awards, including Reporter of the Year. Stan Grant is passionate about justice and humanity. His years of international reporting has given him a deep understanding of how the world works. He is deeply immersed in the politics of history of Asia, the Middle East, and Australia, and he can link the importance of leadership and the impact of history, and above all, believes in the power and resilience of the people. Stan will be talking to us today about the way forward for Indigenous reconciliation. Please welcome Stan Grant. Thank you very much. Uh, from my people, the Wiradjuri and the Gamaroi, I bring greetings and respect to the peoples of the Kulin Nation. And uh, thank you for allowing me to speak on your land today. Yesterday I stood at Bung Yanda, otherwise known as Lake Tyres, in East Gippsland. I'd been invited to speak to a group of educators in Lake's entrance. The local Gunai Kurnai elders kindly invited me back out to their home. These moments are precious to me. They're opportunities to connect with people of another country, of another nation. I was far from the home of my people, the Wiradjuri, of central western New South Wales but I was made welcome. As is our way, I spoke to a local elder there, a lady, and we mapped our personal histories. My family's song lines connect there too. In the late 1880s, my great-great-grandfather, Frank Foster, along with his two sisters, was taken from his home at another mission at Wallaga Lake, just across the New South Wales border and sent to a new Aboriginal settlement at Malaga on the Murray, then to Kamragunja, and later to Warringesda Mission on the Murrumbidgee. Frank eventually married a Wiradjuri woman there, Lydia Naden. Together they had my great-grandmother, who became the matriarch of a big Wiradjuri clan. The Foster family has links into Lake Tyres. Within minutes, the local elder and I connected our ancestry and as we find, wherever we go, we were related. She pointed to a photograph on the local community hall, a man they called Pops Foster, another link in my family tree. This is an ancient ritual for us. This is the expression of our sovereignty. These lived and living ties bind us to each other and to identify who we are and where we are from. As we spoke, this elderly lady and I connected to a tradition older than the 200 plus years of British settlement. This is, was, and always will be Aboriginal land. But how do we reconcile the fact of our occupation, our tens of thousands of years of culture, law, trade, art, and politics, with an Australia that for so long denied our rights, an Australia that still today cannot truly reckon with its past, cannot truly speak of the legitimacy of settlement. The people of Lake Tyres, the Gunai Kurnai, resisted the coming of the whites to their land. Years of guerrilla warfare devastated the people. Massacres left unknown numbers dead, people shot and poisoned. In 1864, a Gippsland squatter, 
Henry Mayrick wrote, the blacks are very quiet here now. No wild beast of the forest was ever hunted down with such unsparing perseverance as they are. Men, women and children are shot whenever they can be met with. The conflict there mirrored the conflict in other parts of the country, a pattern of resistance and death. My people, the Wiradjuri, became locked in years of violence with settlers and soldiers after the crossing of the Blue Mountains in 1813. At the height of the conflict in the 1820s, it was described by the reporting of the Sydney Gazette as an exterminating war. Martial law was declared where Adjury could be killed with impunity. William Cox, a notable settler and a man given the first land grant after the crossing of the mountains, once said, it is better that all the blacks be shot and their carcasses used to manure the ground, which is all the good they are fit for. As I stood in Lake Tyres, I was reminded how we are linked by our stories, our tradition, and our blood that what has happened to us here has happened to us all. The fight for justice, our rights, has never wavered. We have never lost the will, despite overwhelming and often brutal odds. That 200 years plus after the British claimed our country and extinguished our rights, I could stand on a cool winter's afternoon and through our stories find kinship. Earlier this month, I stood somewhere else and I felt the weight of our history there too. I stood in a room in our nation's capital, a room in our national archive. I held our constitution and I felt its pull. In my hands was my country, imperfect, incomplete, indissoluble. Queen Victoria's signature of royal assent is fading as a faint reminder of how it required an act of British Parliament to make Australia a nation. The Constitution sits now protected under glass and dim light, lest the ravages of air and time erase it. Rarely is it removed, and to hold it was a privilege. I have a romantic disposition and affection for tradition and a reverence for antiquity. And with that document yellowed and weathered, removed from the protective glass casing, and resting in my hand, it did hold a powerful resonance. I spent much of my professional life reporting countries and peoples who could not hold, torn apart by age-old enmities, religion, history, and ideology. I have witnessed firsthand the troubles of Northern Ireland that pitted Catholic against Protestant, the Cold War relic of North Korea, the nuclear fault line of Kashmir, and the existential standoff between Pakistan and India the rise of China and its mantra of throwing off a hundred years of foreign humiliation and the bloodied borders of the Middle East. This constitution then speaks to our resolve, our endurance, the strength of Australia's democracy and the capacity for disagreement without violence. The words of our founding document hang heavy with the weight of history. These words come from a time of great debate when a people sought to lift their gaze from parochialism and out of difference to find union. The words speak from our past, define our present and underwrite our future. As these words gave shape to a new commonwealth, so they allowed for a commonwealth still to come, a dynamic nation, a reforming nation. In its final section, section 128, the constitution allows for its own alteration. Change can come only from the people in a referendum carried by a majority of voters in a majority of states. As we have learned, it is a formidable requirement. In 44 referenda put before the people, only on eight occasions has there been successful carriage. On the day I held our constitution, I held to the most resoundingly approved amendment. In my hand was the constitution alteration in brackets, aboriginals, 1967. It won 90.77% of votes cast and carried in all states. It altered both provisions in which Aboriginal people were mentioned. 
Section 51 was amended to give power to the federal government to make laws for Aboriginal people, and it struck out Section 127, which previously had read, in reckoning the numbers of the Commonwealth or of a state or other part of the Commonwealth, Aboriginal natives shall not be counted. In my right hand was the Australian Constitution, in my left hand, the most potent example of the power to change it. In my left hand was a milestone of a journey of my people. Here was the struggle to be heard, to be counted. As the Constitution spoke to me of the enduring strength of Australia's foundation, so it spoke to me too of the subjugation of the First Peoples. As part of me could feel a pride in the creation of an enduring Australian democracy, a still deeper part of me felt a deep, deep conflict. Let us not forget that at the birth of our modern nation, the First Peoples of this land were deemed unfit to be counted. There was no voice for the First Peoples in our Constitution's draft. The prevailing logic was that we were not long for this earth, that the pillow was being smoothed for the death of a peoples who would walk this continent since time immemorial. Alfred Deakin, Australia's first Attorney General and second Prime Minister said, we have the power to deal with people of any race within our borders except the Aboriginal inhabitants of this continent who remain under the custody of the states. There is that single exception of a dying race. Let us hope that in their last hours they'll be able to recognise not simply the justice, but the generosity of the treatment which the white race who are dispossessing them and entering into their heritage are according them. As the referendum of 1967 put a lie to Deakin's prophecy of doom, as Australians resoundingly said, we belong here too. It remained a victory only half won. For there has been and remains an enduring struggle for the rights inherent of the First Peoples. Across the hallway from the room in which the Constitution is preserved into another room which holds the inalienable aspirations of my people. Thirty steps I counted from the Constitution to the Larrakia petition. Gwalwa Daraniki, this is our land. The petition by the Larrakia people of the Northern Territory gathered more than a thousand signatures from Aboriginal people across Australia and was delivered to the Queen in 1972. It is torn and frayed, but it speaks to me with a power still undiminished, a demand so just and clear and yet still so denied. It reads, the British settlers took our land no treaties were signed with the tribes. Today we are refugees, in capital letters. Refugees in the country of our ancestors, we live in refugee camps, without land, without employment, without justice. The petition called for treaties like those of the Maori of New Zealand or the Native Americans. The names of the signatories are scratched on the document, some are marked with thumbprints. Whole communities had signed with the names of their towns. I looked closely and found mine, Griffith, New South Wales. From the Constitution to the Larrakia petition, for me, 30 steps that count the distance between my people and the Australian nation. Aboriginal heroes have fought to bridge that gap, to build a more complete Australia. Joe Anderson, otherwise known as King Burriger of the Dharawal people, said in 1933, all the black man wants is representation in federal parliament. There is plenty of fish in the river for us all and land to grow all we want. In 1937, Victorian Aboriginal leader William Cooper petitioned King George for representation in parliament. The years have not diminished that struggle. In 1963, the year Kalabak petitions were recognised by the Australian Parliament. The Yongu people asserted the ownership of their lands and the right to be heard. In 1966, Vincent Lingiari walked off Wave Hill Station to demand equal pay and won back his land when Gough Whitlam poured the sand through Vincent's fingers. 
Charles Perkins in 1965 led a busload of students throughout outback New South Wales to smash segregation. In 1972, Aboriginal activists pitched a tent on the lawns of Parliament House to demand our rights. In 1988, Yongu leader Gullery Unapingu presented the Barunga Statement to Prime Minister Bob Hawke, demanding what the Yirrkala people had demanded in their petition to the Queen, a treaty. Eddie Mabo, a man from Murray Island, took his battle to the highest court in the land and did not live to see his claim vindicated that this was indeed his land, our land. After the apology to the stolen generations, Gallery Napingu gave a speech talking about what he called serious business, recognition of Indigenous people and meaningful constitutional reform. Serious business to walk the 30 steps from the Constitution to the Larrakia petition. But where is the roadmap for that journey? Professors Megan Davis and Marcia Langton in their introduction to a new book a collection of essays from Indigenous leaders called It's Our Country write, there are two paths from here. One is the path of listening and not hearing. The other is the path of listening and hearing. Listening and hearing. What is our place in this nation? What does it mean to be an Australian? What is the nation's identity and who gets to decide? Our place in Australia, as our history shows, has never been comfortable. We have been invisible, framed by what the black American writer Toni Morrison has called the white gaze. In the white imagination, we were at first an archaic civilization devoid of rights or basic humanity, then a doomed race bound for extinction or a people forecast to disappear, to be absorbed into Australia to be assimilated. Where is a place in Australia for the First Peoples with rights inherent, with the capacity to determine our destinies, to preserve our traditions, our languages, our song lines? Australia can be said to be a nation that leads the world in creating a tolerant, cohesive and safe multicultural society, the current excitement over a resurgent Pauline Hanson and calls for a ban on Muslim migration notwithstanding. But we lag the world when it comes to the rights of Indigenous peoples, the only Commonwealth nation not to have signed a treaty with First Peoples. Why is it that Canada, the US, New Zealand can acknowledge fundamental rights and we still cannot? Standing in Melbourne, I note that this state of Victoria has begun a process that may indeed see the first such treaty on Australian soil. While the federal government still inches forward on an as yet undefined idea of constitutional recognition. As a member of the referendum council that is consulting with indigenous communities across the country, I am hopeful, as I am hopeful for a treaty here in Victoria. I believe treaty and recognition are not mutually exclusive. Indeed, they may inform each other, but I'm also mindful and if my optimism sometimes threatens to overtake my judgment, my people are very quick to remind me that the First Nations struggle to have faith in a system of justice that is not always shown faith in us. The philosopher Hegel spoke of people not being at home in the world. For Indigenous people, we have to contemplate the reality of not being at home in our world estranged in the very land of our ancestors. The Australian political philosopher Duncan Iverson has tried to reconcile Western liberal democratic ideals with the plight of Indigenous peoples to try to make a better fit. He speaks of a theory of justice that enables people to feel at home in the world when he or she is not alienated from the institutions and practices of that society. That being at home in the world is not just having to be resigned to accepting or accommodating injustice. He notes John Rawls' idea of reconciliation through public reason, of people being able to endorse the institutions and practices of society and not merely have to tolerate them. 
Of course, Iverson cautions that for some, this may not in fact be feasible. Such people are caught in an in-betweenness that can appear inescapably hopeless. This is a hopelessness that can be seen amongst indigenous peoples who withdraw from the political process that can appear to have abandoned them, manifest in all the social ills that we see afflicting such societies. We see that here in seemingly intractable socioeconomic disadvantage, catastrophic imprisonment rates, and heartbreaking incidents of youth suicide. Indigenous kids under the age of 14 are nine times more likely to take their own lives. Nine times. How do we bring hope to this hopelessness? There are fundamental questions here, questions of the foundation of Australian settlement, questions about the capacity of our political system to accommodate the rights of Indigenous peoples. Indeed, questions about what those rights are and how we decide. Taiake Alfred, a leading voice in Canadian Indigenous governance, speaks of the entire discourse of rights being imposed on Indigenous people. He says, Aboriginal rights are in fact the benefits accrued by Indigenous peoples who have agreed to abandon their autonomy in order to enter the legal and political framework of the state. It's a sobering thought. One will have to park perhaps for another day, but one that hangs over Indigenous communities. That said, let's accept our political reality. How to be at home in this liberal democratic world that has been not just imposed on us, but indeed is complicit with the very act of colonisation? Can our Australian democracy cope with the demands, the unceasing demands, of the First Nations peoples? How do we find what American political scientist William Connolly has called a vital centre of the nation? Do the rights of minority groups require passing through that centre? Who determines that centre? What values are posited there? Connolly also warns of a black hole at the centre, a place occupied by the loudest voices of narcissists who wish only their self-representation. We see and hear those people on our television screens and our radio stations and in our media today. The centre is being challenged and redefined in our world as we see a rise of populist voices on the left and right. Here in Australia, a polity looking for something to believe in. A quarter of Australian voters at the recent election abandoned the major parties in favour of a constellation of interests, some returning to the old siren song of One Nation and Pauline Hanson. Our democracy is being recast, and the clamour of voices, and in that clamour of voices, ours, the First Peoples, needs to be heard. If our core commitment to Western is to Western liberal values, how do we make a place for those who have lived outside that world? How do we make Indigenous peoples feel at home without being extinguished? Can we, to paraphrase J.S. Mill, soften the extreme form and fill up the intervals between us? These are the questions I pondered as I drove from Lake Tyres, as I drove across the land of the Gunai Kurnai, and I watched mist fall over fields that have been sites of death. It is the question I pondered as I stood in the National Archive in Canberra earlier this month. When I held the Australian Constitution, I did feel a great reverence. But when I looked upon the Larrakia petition, I felt belonging. I felt at home in the world. The measure of our country is when those great documents can speak equally to us all. Thank you.
is there a peculiar Australian type of denial of our history that is going on here that it's 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 remains um, controversial to use the word genocide. We don't really acknowledge the frontier wars. Mm. Is is that is that I, part of our inability to move I forward? I was with my father just this week, back on our country, and we were watching television news, and uh, we saw the reporting of the commemorations of France. And indeed, my father's uncle, my great uncle, lies on those fields. The Wiradjuri man who signed up to fight for this country when his rights were being denied here at home. My dad said, it's amazing how Australia needs to mourn and pay respect to its fallen and we can't pay respect to ours. Only minutes from where my father lives is a place called Poison Waterholes Creek. I took my son there, my youngest son, earlier this year. I wanted him to connect to that sense of history. I wanted him to know something about what has formed us. He's lived most of his life outside of Australia. And I explained how the water hole was poisoned and the Wiradjuri people died. And I explained how those who survived fled to an island in the middle of the Murrumbidgee River called Murdering Island where they were shot by the settlers. My father said, why can't we hold a commemoration every year at Murdering Island? And he knows that to even suggest such a thing would be to risk, in the eyes of some, dividing the very community that he lives in. A suppression and a denial of our history, while Australia gets to celebrate and commemorate its own. It is peculiar. It's peculiar to a country that is shaped by terra nullius. The idea that a people here did not in legal effect exist, had no rights, and those rights could be extinguished. That despite the secret instructions given to Captain James Cook to be able to claim Australia or this land with the consent of the people, that never happened. Terra nullius is not just a legal doctrine, and even though it was overthrown or overturned in the Mabo decision of 1992, it, is, it goes to the psyche of a country that still cannot see the people. It informs what Bill Stanner, the anthropologist, called the Great Australian Silence, a cult of forgetting on a national scale that didn't tell the stories of the Wiradjuri or the Gunai Kurnai or any of the other hundreds of nations that felt the sting of colonisation and invasion. We can't have that discussion because it's almost deemed to be invalid. It informed the white Australia policy, and the idea of locking out the so-called coloured races and it hovers over a debate that we still have in Australia today, not just about Indigenous rights, but what Anne Alley was talking about earlier, and that is how we make room for contending, contesting, competing arguments, ideologies and religions and cultures in a Western liberal democratic system. Canada, with its competing Quebecois claims to nationhood, its Indigenous rights, its British inheritance, manages to pull that together in a commonwealth that is functioning when the sky doesn't fall. New Zealand Treaty of Waitangi informs that country's ethos and history and the sky doesn't fall. But in Australia, we still struggle to even have the debate. And the word you used is the correct one. It's peculiar. Yeah. Yes, um, Brian Keon Cohen from the Victorian Bar. Stan, thank you for that address. You mentioned um, t two ways forward in terms of reconciliation. The first, constitutional recognition. The second, uh, entering into a treaty mm. or treaties, plural. Yeah. And you mentioned you were of the view that they may not, that they may be complementary. Mm. A treaty is usually 
an international agreement between sovereign nations. Mm. I'm just interested in your attitude to overcoming that hurdle, since clearly, today, mm. Aboriginal communities are not sovereign, are not mm. sovereign nations. But yeah. is there some way through this? Uh, the treaties that exist in Canada and North America and New Zealand are treaties that exist within the sovereignty of the states of those countries. So the treaties of sovereign peoples in New Zealand sit within the sovereignty of the Canadian government, as is the treaties of, of, of Waitangi in New Zealand. Peculiar in New Zealand because the Treaty of Waitangi, of course, came before, before the sovereignty of the state of New Zealand. It was the Big Bang that gave rise to the state of New Zealand. So there is a model for treaties between sovereign peoples within an overarching sovereign state. Uh, the various discussions that are being had at the moment, I was fortunate enough to be here in Victoria to um, be involved in the treaty discussions. I was really honoured to be invited to mediate those discussions over two days, uh, predicated on the belief that there is a sovereignty here. The people are sovereign people and they can enter into sovereign agreements with the sovereign state of Victoria that enshrine the self-determination of the local people. And uh, at the same time, of course, there is a, a process underway for potentially going to a referendum around recognition, which as part of that discussion is looking at a, uh, what Noel Pearson has described as a hook, which can be placed at the apex of that constitution, which may give rise to a formalised representative body that can inform and advise government about policy towards Indigenous peoples and may perhaps be a mechanism for future negotiations of treaties. So there are many ways of sort of looking at this. And of course, treaties are, are not just treaties that exist between countries at an international level. There are treaties, are trade treaties. There are defence pacts that are called treaties. There are, I think Mick Dodson, um, recently said that there are 17,000 forms of agreement in Australia right now between, non -indi between Indigenous people and various non-Indigenous entities. Yeah, well, Na sure. Native title, land rights, um, water rights, land use, land management agreements with mining companies that form in their way small treaties that have not been given that full overarching impact yet. Well, we needn't get obsessed with language. We live in a federation yeah. where sovereignty is divided yeah. between the Commonwealth, the States and, and the, the States. Territories. Yeah. So yeah. lots of precedence there. There is, exactly, exactly. We, we live in a, a country of layered sovereignty. Layered sovereignty, yeah. No, thank you for your question. We'll take the next two questions thank, together. Thank so you. there's one George, there and then one down here. Georgina Gartland, Concerned Australian. Thank you, Stan. Sorry, um, I can't see you. Just here. Thank you. Oh, there you are. Yep, thanks. There's a microphone um, here. It's my question me. was around sovereignty, actually. Could you explain sovereignty to us? And um, I, I know through our work with the Yulnu, they very much um, believe, and they are, they are sovereign peoples, mm. Mm. and they're ready for treaty now. Mm. So where do you see this, and a lot of other nation groups as well. So uh, this is a conversation I believe we need out there in, yeah. in the mainstream, which yeah. is, yeah, so it's, thank you. It's a difficult, thank you. Uh, look, I'm not constitutional lawyer, um, and I wouldn't pretend to be. I, I, I read a lot of philosophy and read a lot of law, and um, you know, I think it behooves us as Indigenous people to try to understand our place in the world. Uh, the moment you move into a sovereignty discussion in Australia, of course, it's hijacked by those people who wish to paint it as being something that's antithetical to the Australian state that somehow diminishes the Australian state. As John Howard said, how can a country have a treaty with itself? Well, of course, other countries do exactly that. They do exactly that. Um, sovereignty is defined in many different ways. There is a sovereignty as a state of mind, of a belief in your connection to place and country, a connection that in our case extends to time immemorial, to our ancestors and our song lines. When I walked into Lake Tyres, when I was invited by the people to sit down with them there, I was respecting their sovereignty and connecting my song lines to them. A visible and real expression of a lived and ancient sovereignty. There is, of course, the political sovereignty. There is the sovereignty that is defined in the 
Westphalian tradition around the nation state, usually enforced through the use of military might. We see that contest right now in the Middle East with Islamic State establishing a state of their own, equipping it with a military uh, and, and proclaiming their borders, occupying that and trying to act as a state. We see it around the disputed borders of the Middle East and the breakup of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. We see sovereignty defined in places like North Korea, clinging to an old Cold War division, arming themselves with the capacity to defend what they fear of being an invasion from the United States. And we see a battle over sovereignty played out in the South China Sea right now. China laying claim to disputed islands that could very easily trigger a much broader conflict. And then there is the projected, claimed and contested sovereignty of various peoples. Peoples that exist within nation states, the Catalan, the Basque, the Quebecois, indigenous peoples, uh, the Welsh, the Scottish, people who are trying to express their political identity based around their idea of nationhood when that nation has been subsumed by a state apparatus. So there are many ways of defining it. There are many contests around the world in trying to define exactly how those sovereignties would be expressed. Here in Australia, as I outlined, I think while there are those who look at ways of trying to reconfigure the idea of the state. Secession is one, of course, that people in other parts of the world have looked to. Not something that, given our political reality, is broadly accepted as feasible here. So we are left with a Western liberal democratic ideal that is contested and fought over. And can we expand the notion of that Western liberal dem democracy to include group rights in what is a system predicated around the freedom of the rights of the individual. And this is our struggle as Indigenous peoples, to find a place to be at home, to engage with the nation and have allegiance to the nation with our rights respected, and then freeing individuals to pursue their individual aspirations and dreams, to walk with dignity and honour and justice in the country of our ancestors. That is a difficult discussion to have in a heated political and media environment which is so often predicated around conflict rather than trying to understand and enlarge the idea of what we can be and who we can be as a nation. Thank you. We've got, we'll have one, okay. one last question. Um, Venus Kalesi from the Australian Baha'i Community. Thank you, Stan, for your presentation today and also for your <coughs> narrative of talking to my country, which is Thank so you. compelling and informative. Um, as a media personality, I wanted to ask... Oh, that's a terrible word. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I don't I know if I have a personality. As an editor of three different uh, national media outlets, how do you see the role of the media, its influence, um, in shaping the, the discourse on Indigenous yeah. reconciliation. It's crucial, and it's especially crucial at this time where our polity is so fractured and so contested. There is a quest for authenticity right now in our, in our national political discourse, and as a result of that, we see a fracturing of that political centre and people looking elsewhere, and the rise of people who are seen to represent some form of authenticity. So Pauline Hanson strikes a chord because of the way people can relate to her as an expression of how people feel rather than necessarily what they know, or what the facts of the argument are. The media is attracted to those types of lightning rods, individuals who can uh, personify those fractures in the community. Who can, and, you know, what better than just someone like Pauline, who is now a brand, who exists as a one-word name, like Madonna, you know, Elvis, it's just Pauline. And, 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 and you know, that's the, the, media, the media likes those sorts of individuals. They are good copy. Um, the media is built around a paradigm of conflict, Journalists in instinctively 
go to the point of conflict in a story as a way of being able to, dis- to then describe the elements of those stories in a fairly simplistic and more often than not entertaining way. But in the com- contest around that conflict, you lose nuance. So we're not going to necessarily remake the media. The age of social media has added another dimension to that, and that's both put the access to information into the hands of people more widely, but has also created its own fault lines around abuse and lateral violence and you know, intimidation, which is then carried over into the mainstream media. How often do you see the mainstream media today now reporting conversations online as if they are representative of a national discourse um, rather than the the heated sort of abuse hurled by people who hide behind, you know, pseudonyms. So, but that is the reality. We live in this time. It gives rise to people like Donald Trump It gives rise to people like Marine Le Pen in France on the one hand, or Syriza in Greece on the other. We live at a time when people are challenged by globalization, manufacturing jobs drying up, the question of borders up for debate, the question of values up for debate, Brexit born out of a desire of people to reclaim what they see as their own inherent sovereignty, Uh, the economic claims of sovereignty of countries like Greece, And this is very heated, contested space, and the media feeds off that conflict. So we have to accept that this is our political time and this is our media, and then for people who engage with that space to walk into that with their eyes wide open and understand that you need to be forceful and you need to be coherent and you need to present what you can present in as factual and uh, cohesive a way as possible, but mindful of the fact that you are entering into this combative environment and the media is not necessarily going to do you any any favors sadly why am i still in it i don't know but there it goes <laughs>